All right, so we're diving deep today into Nepal's hydropower scene, getting into the nitty gritty of two approaches you've been asking about, run of river and peaking run of river. Roar or proar. Exactly, roar and proar. Now, these terms can seem a bit, well, technical. So we're going to break them down using what you sent us and explore how Nepal's using these unique methods to meet its energy needs. It's actually pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah, definitely. To start, can you give us a simple explanation of what run of river hydropower actually is? Sure. So run of river hydropower basically means generating power from the natural flow of a river without the need for those big dams you might picture with traditional hydro projects. So like no massive reservoirs, no flooding entire valleys to create artificial lakes. Exactly. The beauty of Roar is that it works in harmony with the river. You have these power plants often nestled right alongside the river, capturing energy from the current as it flows naturally. Makes sense. <laughs> but rivers don't always flow at the same rate, right? What happens during drier periods when there's less water? You're right, that's a key factor with Roar. These plants are best suited for what we call perennial rivers, rivers that flow consistently year-round. If the wadi level drops too low, the turbines can't operate efficiently, or even at all. So there's like a minimum level of water needed to keep things running. Exactly. That's where the concept of technical flow comes in. It's the minimum amount of water that needs to remain in the river, both for power generation and for the health of the river itself. Like making sure there's enough water for the power plant and the fish. Exactly. It's about striking a balance. And this technical flow requirement is something that's carefully considered when planning and operating ROAR projects. Okay, so ROAR utilizes a river's natural flow. Mm -hmm. Are there any examples of ROAR successfully working in Nepal? Oh, absolutely. Nepal actually has several successful ROAR projects. Kimtitin is a great example, one of the first and a real testament to how ROAR can bring electricity to remote communities. Then you have others like Indrawati II and Botakoshi, all making use of Nepal's abundant river systems. Now, on to peaking run of river. I'm guessing it's similar to roar, but with a little extra something. You got it. Piror builds upon the basic roar concept, but adds the capability to store a limited amount of water. This allows it to adjust its power output to meet those periods of peak demand. Like when everyone's getting home from work, turning on lights, cooking dinner, that kind of thing. Exactly. It's about matching energy production with those peak consumption periods. So instead of just generating power based on the immediate river flow, PRAR can store some water and release it strategically to boost output when it's most needed. So how exactly does that work? Where does the water get stored? Well, during the dry season, PRAR projects use what we call daily pondage. It's basically a small reservoir or pond that allows them to store water during off-peak hours. Then, when demand spikes, they release that stored water, giving the turbines an extra push to meet that demand. Makes sense. But what about during the rainy season when there's plenty of water flowing? Doesn't that stored water become a problem? Not really, no. During periods of high flow, like the monsoon season, Pure Art plants actually operate more like traditional roar plants. They allow the excess water to flow downstream naturally, ensuring the river's ecosystem isn't disrupted. Right. Got to keep that balance. Absolutely. And this is important for sediment transport and maintaining the overall health of the river. So PR adapts to both high and low flow conditions. Pretty versatile, right? Yeah, very cool. So it sounds like it can adapt to the natural ebb and flow of the river, making it more efficient than purely roar. Exactly. And here's a technical detail that really highlights that adaptability. The installed capacity of PRR projects actually exceeds the typical dependable flow of the river. Meaning it has more power generating potential than the river usually provides. Right. And this ensures it can meet those peak demands, usually for a window of around four to six hours during those dry spells. Got it. So any examples of PRR projects successfully operating in Nepal? Absolutely. There are several. Marciandi, Kalagandaki, Middle Marciandi, Sinkoshi, and Panadi are all prime examples. These projects show how PRR can effectively provide power while working in sync with Nepal's water cycles. It's amazing how these projects are specifically designed around Nepal's unique landscape and climate. So let's do a little head-to-head -head comparison. What are the key takeaways, the major differences between ROAR and PRR? Well, ROAR is generally seen as having a lower environmental impact because it doesn't involve large-scale water storage or significantly altering the natural river flow. So less disruptive, more in tune with the natural environment. Right. But the trade-off is that its power output is directly tied to the river's flow, 
making it less flexible when it comes to meeting those fluctuating energy demands. So Roar is like the reliable friend, always there, consistent, but maybe not so good with surprises. That's a good way to put it. But wouldn't that reliance on consistent flow make Roar vulnerable to climate change, which could bring more unpredictable weather patterns? That's a very important point. Climate change and its potential impact on river flows are definitely major considerations when planning any hydropower project, especially Roar. You need to factor in those potential changes in precipitation, snowmelt patterns, and overall water availability. It makes you realize how interconnected everything is, right? Energy, environment, climate, it's all intertwined. Absolutely, and that's why careful planning and a focus on sustainability are so crucial. So where does PRR fit into all of this? Well, PRR, with its ability to store water, offers more flexibility in adapting to those fluctuating demands and even provides a bit of a buffer during drier periods, which could become more frequent with climate change. It's more adaptable, more resilient. Exactly. And it can also play a role in flood control by strategically releasing stored water during periods of high flow, helping to mitigate potential flooding downstream. So PR is like the friend who can roll with the punches, handle a bit of chaos. You got it. It's about having that extra layer of control and flexibility. But, and this is important to remember, both Roar and Proar have environmental considerations that need to be addressed. Right. It's not just about generating energy. It's about doing it responsibly. Exactly. Maintaining that minimum flow downstream, that technical flow we talked about, is crucial for the health of the river ecosystem. It ensures aquatic life can thrive and that downstream communities have access to the water they need. And in a country like Nepal, with its incredible biodiversity and reliance on its rivers, those considerations are paramount. Couldn't agree more. Finding that balance between meeting energy needs and ensuring environmental sustainability is a challenge, not just in Nepal, but globally. Like this intricate dance, right? Yeah. Trying to meet our demands while respecting the limits of the planet. Yeah, absolutely. So to quickly recap, Roar harnesses the natural flow of rivers, while PRR incorporates water storage for peak demand management. Both play a crucial role in Nepal's energy landscape, demonstrating the country's focus on finding sustainable solutions. Right. It's about utilizing resources in a smart and responsible way. Exactly. But as Nepal continues to develop its hydropower potential, it faces that constant challenge of balancing those energy needs with protecting its incredible natural environment. It's a complex issue, but one that deserves our attention, especially as we think about building a more sustainable future for everyone. For sure. And I think that leads to a great question for our listeners to ponder. As Nepal moves forward, what are some innovative ways they could ensure both their energy needs and their ecological concerns are addressed effectively? Yeah, it's something to think about, both for Nepal and for other countries grappling with similar challenges. How do we power our world while preserving the beauty and health of our planet? It's a big question, but one worth exploring. Agreed. And a question we'll continue to explore right here on The Deep Dive. Yeah, definitely. Until next time. See you then.